if I may call Mr. Smith. Yes. Stand, please. Repeat after me. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing <coughs> but the truth. Mr. Spitz, my name is Sam Stevens, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Could I ask you to state your full name, please? Hello, uh, my name is David John Smith. Uh, thank you for giving your evidence to the inquiry today. I want to turn to your witness statement. Uh, it should be in a bundle of documents in front of you, dated 23rd of February 2024. Yep. Uh, and it running to 98 paragraphs. Can I ask you please to turn to page 32, as I understand you want to make some clarifications to parag uh, uh, paragraph 92. Yes, that, that's right. Um, simple, simple changes really. Um, when I wrote this, I wasn't uh, able to see the board minutes that um, gave me the exact time when I uh, took over as chief customer officer and Paula took over as managing director. So in here... When you say we, Paula, you mean Paula Venels? Paula Venels, yes, sorry. Um, in here we talk about November, December 2010. In fact, I'm now aware that um, from the board minutes that Paula took over, um, I think it was the middle of October, the exact date I think is in that board minute, but around the 18th, which actually means that that paragraph is slightly wrong. It should say in around September 2010 it became clear around the direction and also to clarify that I handed over the day-to-day -day running to Paula Venables as per the board minute on October the 18th. Otherwise I'm happy with the statement. Uh, just as a matter of clarity as well, the last sentence you say I was still a director of Paul Board, Post Office Limited Board, uh, currently says for, f for six or seven months. Yes, forgive me. The, I mean, the exact date, I think, is in the company's house records sometime in July. So it's to, to reflect the exact date, I think, would be better. Could I ask you, please, to turn to um, page 35 of your statement? Yes. Do you see a signature? I do. Is that your signature? It is. And subject to the clarifications you just made, are the contents of the statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, they are. That statement now stands as your evidence to the inquiry. I'm going to ask you some statements about it, some questions about it and other matters. Dealing very briefly with your professional background, um, you qualified as a chartered accountant in 1989. Yes. And you joined Royal Mail Group, PLC, uh, in August 2002. Yes. And your prior board experience to jo before joining Royal Mail uh, was being finance director at two other companies. Excuse me, yes. At this point, I think it's, it's probably helpful to try to summarise the structure of Post Office Limited and Royal Mail when you took over as managing director. Okay. Um, I mean, the actual company structure is quite complicated because there are lots of subsidiaries, but in simple terms, there's a group holding company, Royal Mail Group. A subsidiary of that company was the post office uh, group, and underneath the post office there were then some individual subsidiaries as well. Um, so my responsibility was as a, a director of Royal Mail Group and then also the managing director of post office and all its subsidiaries. So let's go through it in stages. You were a member of the Post Office Limited Board. Yes. Um, that was a, well, there were two other group companies I want to ask you about at the time. One was Royal Mail Group Limited, and the other was Royal Mail Holdings PLC. Yep. And is it right that Post Office Limited was a subsidiary of Royal Mail Group Limited? I believe so. I, d I can't remember the exact structure, but yes, inside the group, it was a subsidiary. <laughs> and Royal Mail Group Limited was a subsidiary of Royal Mail Royal Holdings. Company. Yes, I believe so. Uh, of Royal Mail Group Limited and Royal Mail Holdings PLC, which, if any, board meetings did you attend of those two companies? 
I think I attended all of the uh, of both of them because I was a director of both companies. And which board of which company was responsible for the group? It would have been the, I think it was the PLC board at the top. It's the top holding company. Thank you. Back to your career. Before joining Post Office, you served as Finance Director of Parcel Force, which was a part of the Royal Mail Group. Yes. And between 2007 and 2009, you were Managing Director of Parcel Force. That's right. You were appointed to, as Managing Director of Post Office Limited in April 2010. Yes. Prior to joining Post Office Limited as Managing Director, what was your understanding of the culture of management within Post Office Limited? Um, I, didn't, I didn't really have a strong perception of it. Um, my time was in Parcel Force, which is a very separate subsidiary of the group, um, doing entirely different things. Um, so the only perceptions I really would have had was the occasional group meetings um, where the MD of the post office and the MD of Parcel Force would have met, um, which uh, would have been part of the sort of management reporting. But inside the company itself, I didn't really have anything to do with the post office before I joined it. So I couldn't really comment on the culture. It's right, your, your predecessor as Managing Director of Post Office Limited was Alan Cook. That's right. When you took over as Managing Director, did you have a meeting with Alan Cook to discuss the, the company? I, I can't recall the precision of it, but I'm sure we would have had not one meeting, but a number of conversations. I'm sure we would have done. Please could we bring up uh, your witness statement, um, page 9, paragraph 21. You say um, that your role as MD and company director at Paul, Post Office Limited, was no different to any other CEO or director role. That can come down, thank you. So whilst this was a different title, managing director, um, did you see your role as managing director of Post Office Limited as akin to a CEO of another company? Yes, um, in that it was about setting the strategy and direction and resources for the business. That's what I meant by that. You remained Managing Director of Post Office Limited for, uh, well, we've, we've discussed it until October, uh, start in April and then October 2010. When you joined in April 2010, did you expect your appointment to be a long-term one? Yes, very much so. Come back to that in due course. Before moving on, um, I want to talk about some codes and principles of corporate governance. D did you apply or take into account any codes relevant to corporate governance and management? The uh, structures of the of the business, um, as as the, the wider group, were well established before I joined, um, so I didn't change anything. Um, but I was well aware, as having been a director of a number of companies, of the general requirements of corporate governance. Um, to what extent did you pay regard to the Financial Reporting Council's combined code for corporate governance when you were managing director of Post Office Limited? I think I was aware of it through the sort of annual audit cycle um, and would have taken counsel, for instance, from the auditors um, as part of the management letter process as to the controls that were needed and the, and the governance steps that were needed. Um, so to that extent, I was aware of it. And in, in your view, were your expectations for the standards of corporate governance in a publicly owned company like Post Office Limited different to your expectations for a publicly listed company? Yeah, there is a difference. Um, there's obviously the listing requirements from the stock exchange, for example, um, that lay out clear um, distinctions in terms of, of, of requirements. So I was aware there was a difference, um, but um, I don't think I spent a large amount of time thinking about that in that particular period.
would any of those differences which you understood there to be have affected your executive function as managing director? I don't know that I thought about that at the time, I'm sorry. I want then to look at the executive function and the executive team. We've touched on the Post Office Limited Board already. In your witness statement, you describe a level down of management called the executive team. Yeah. And you chaired the executive team. Is it fair to say that the executive team was responsible uh, for running the post office business? For, from a day to day perspective, yes. And the attendees would have included Susan Crichton. Yes. You're nodding, yes. And at that point, she was head of legal of Post Office Limited. I think that was a title. I can't be entirely certain, but yes, that was the broad area of her responsibility. And Paula Venels attended those meetings? Yes, she did. Her role was network director? Yes. And they all in the, on the executive team reported to you? Yes, I think that's right. As managing director, would you accept that ultimate executive accountability for the operation of Post Office Limited rested with you? Yes. And in your witness statement, you say that the executive team met once a week. Yeah, I think so. This is vague in time. Um, we would have generally been meeting to talk about day-to-day -day matters on a, on a weekly basis. We probably met more formally once a month, um, and that would have been used to inform uh, anything that then went up to the, uh, the poll board. Can you just give a, a precy of what would have been discussed at the um, weekly meetings? So it would have been uh, typically maybe we've got a new product launch, are we ready for it? Um, there's a particular um, question that's come in that we need to think about or answer from maybe the operation. Um, we might have been talking about the um, sort of systems rollout that was taking place at the time because we were looking at that on a daily, weekly basis in my early days. Um, so it's the day-to-day, -day, what needs to be fixed tomorrow, what do I need to be aware of immediately type of things, rather than anything, say, more strategic or long-term. And just so we're clear, Susan Crichton attended those meetings? I believe so, yes. And the monthly meetings within the executive team, were they where the more strategic decisions were made? Yes, they were more structured. So we would have been, for instance, <laughs> looking at the financial results for the month, uh, looking at the progress on the change programmes in the business. Um, we might have been reviewing investment cases that we wanted to take forwards to the board. Um, so it was definitely more strategic, yes. And you referred to preparing things to then be taken up to the Post Office Limited board. Yes. Who was responsible for the transferring information from the executive team to the Post Office Limited board? Well, as, as a combination, we had a company secretary. Um, the, the agenda would largely be um, discussed between the company secretary, myself, and the chair. Um, and there would have, I believe, have been a set of standing agenda items through the year that we would have expected to look at for example, health and safety. Um, and so those items would have been collated into an agenda and then the company secretary would have pulled the appropriate papers together, probably with the help of, um, of my own exec assistant. Just to clarify those, um, that firstly, the, the chair and the company secretary, they didn't attend the executive team meetings? Uh, the chair definitely didn't. I'm not sure about the company secretary. But in terms of who was aware of or on top of the discussions at the executive team level? Yes. And what information from the executive team level needed to go up to the board? That was your responsibility. It would have channeled through me, yes. Who was responsible for passing relevant information from the operation of Post Office Limited to the parent company? I. Um well, there are a number of informal channels, but the formal channel was I had a monthly report that would be sent to the group and would be part of the group board pack. And at the board meeting, there would be a standing item where I would talk through the matters that uh, the main board needed to know about. And 
the month, the formal monthly channel, who yes. was, which person was that report to? I would imagine, but can't be certain, it would have been the company secretary of the group. What were the informal channels? Well, oh, oh, it was a group matrix. Um, so, for example, communications would talk to the communications team centrally, finance would talk to the finance team centrally, um, etc. So those informal matrices um, would sometimes have a hard line into me, sometimes have a dotted line into me, and maybe a hard line into the finance director of the group. But those were the, what I meant by informal channels. So is it, is it fair to say that um, from the executive team, you had a responsibility to pass information to the post office limited board and to the parent company? Yes. Yes. But there were other lines of communication below you between the Post Office Limited company and the parent company. Exactly so. Did you ever find that the corporate structure within the group obstructed or hindered the flow of relevant information through the group? I'm not sure that I did. Um, the only reason for the pause is as we get to the back end of my time in the group, we are starting to think about the possibility of separating Royal Mail from post office. And we therefore started to think about the difference in terms of um, duties of care that those two groups had got. And whilst I can't pick out a, a specific example that says here was something that caused friction here, I'm sure that we were aware of that governance change and we're managing our way through it during the sort of uh, later months of my time in, uh, in, the, in the group. But, but other it, than that, no. And it sounds like nothing um, stands out to you as a particular bit of information that you couldn't get to the relevant part of the group because no, of the group structure? No, no, no. <coughs> we don't need to turn it up, um, but in your statement, you refer to one of your responsibilities to make sure that the right control systems were in place for risk management and finance. Would you agree that identifying, analysing and managing risk is a very important part of running a company? Yes. Would, you, would it be fair to say it goes to the heart of the role of the company executive? Yes. What steps did you take on becoming managing director to satisfy yourself that the post office business had identified all relevant risks in its business? Yeah. Um, the business, like the wider group, ran a formal risk register. Re put my teeth in. Risk register. Um, and um, also had internal audit functions um, to review uh, the controls um, and systems that were in place across the group. I... Uh, reviewed those systems as part of my induction process, i.e. have we got a risk register, is it covering the right sorts of risks, etc. I also um, had, or we had, a regular process for an audit committee uh, where risks would be reviewed and we also had a standing agenda to review sort of outcomes of each of the audits each month as they came through the organisation. So there, there was on that side. And then from a financial side, um, we obviously had the uh, internal audit teams also looking at finance controls and finance systems. Um, and we also had the external auditors working with us. I had known Ian Y uh, in my previous roles in the business, so I was comfortable that the types of audits that they were likely to perform would be sufficient to satisfy our duties um, and also met with EMY as part of the process for sort of preparations for audit, reviewing management letters uh, and of the signing of the accounts process itself. Could you just provide for the record, provide the job title of Ian Wise? Sorry. Um, Is it Ian Wise? Ernst Young, yeah. It would... Oh, Ian Wise, sorry. Yeah, Ernst Young, the you. auditors. <laughs> I, I, yes, I, I apologise, I misheard you. Um, To what extent um, did you consult with teams such as the legal department within Post Office Limited when um, considering the risk register of, of how to identify risk? 
I, I can't remember exactly how this would have worked um, at the time, but certainly the all all parts of the senior management team would have been involved in building the risk register. All parts of the management team, as in the exec team that I was describing earlier, would have reviewed the outputs of the risk register. And so legal, just like all other departments, would have had the opportunity to go through and flag any concerns that they had got. Um, and then we would have discussed what are the mitigants that we can put in place um, to um, uh, ameliorate those risks. With that in mind, I want to move to oversight of prosecutions. Uh, in your witness statement, we don't need to turn it up, but you say that you are almost certain that Susan Crichton gave you a briefing on the work of the legal department when you joined as managing director. Yeah. And you say that that would have likely included the criminal enforcement work. Can you remember any further detail of the I'm sorry, I can't. Um, my induction would have taken place through sort of April of that year. Um, I do know that we set up a fairly extensive induction, so it was across all parts of the business, not just in the head office, but going out to visit branches, for instance, going out to the cash centres and all of those things. Um, so I do know that that was arranged and organised, but I can't remember the specifics, I'm afraid, of what would have been discussed and disclosed in each of those sessions. You, you may have to forgive me for just going through this in, in stage. I want, I want to ask what you, what you think you knew at the time. Were you aware of the prosecution of sub-postmasters for theft, fraud offences and false accounting when you were managing director? Yes, I would have been, yes. And would that have been from the start of your time as managing director? It would have certainly been in the early days. It may not have been on day one, but certainly as part of that induction process. And also the fact that in the monthly management uh, meetings, we would have had standard reports from each department. And certainly I can remember the legal department would have laid out, these are the current cases that we're working on. I want to come to those reports in a moment. Staying with what you knew, were you aware that those prosecutions were pursued using data generated by the Horizon IT system? I don't think I was initially, but certainly I was. I became aware of it. I can't remember when, but I did become aware of it. At an operational level, who did you think was carrying out the investigations that led to those prosecutions? Um, I was aware that there were a combination of people involved, but that we had a security function whose day job it would have been to uh, audit the branch, gather the evidence and bring it back into the business to consider what to be done about it. You, you said we had an audit function, I think. When you say we, who do you... As in the post office, sorry. Post office limited. Yes. And can I be clear, uh, Mr Smith, when you use the expression we or the expression the business, yes. can I take it that you're talking about the legal entity, the post office limited? Sir, so, yes, I will try to be clear that if I don't mean that, I will pull out what entity I'm talking about. Yeah. But so because far, yes, that's what, what I'm I mean. anxious to avoid is any misunderstanding of crossovers between any part of Royal Mail and the post office, if yes. you understand. So I, I'd like you to be precise if you would. Yes, OK. Again, at an operational level, who did you think was responsible for the decision of whether or not to prosecute a sub-postmaster? I think that I believed that that was the legal team. Which legal team? Sorry, under Sue Crichton. I don't, I don't recall the structure underneath Sue, but it would have been under Sue's um, team. So the Post Office Limited? Yes, legal. yes. Post Office Limited, not Royal Mail. Again, staying operationally, who did you think was responsible for the conduct of those prosecutions? Again, the same team. Now, there's a difference between the conducting of prosecution, investigations, etc. Who did you think was responsible for providing legal advice to Post Office Limited on the conduct of prosecutions and investigations? 
I was aware that we had a um, separate um, external legal firm supporting us. Um, I don't think I knew for certain, but I would have imagined that between the post office legal team and any external support that they may have required, between them they would have made that decision. To what extent did you think that, uh, at an operational level, responsibility for any of those matters to do with prosecution um, lay with Royal Mail Group or Royal Mail Holdings? Well, in that it was a, uh, the Post Office Limited was a subsidiary of the group, there's, there's clearly a, a, a reporting line and, and responsibility there, but I was clear that the conduct of all of the decision making lay in Post Office Limited um, through the legal structure that I described earlier, not at Royal Mail Group. To what extent did you consider that the Post Office was in an unusual position in that it was the alleged victim of crimes that it was investigating, that it investigated those crimes itself and then decided whether to prosecute them? I'm sad to say at the time I didn't really reflect on it in the way that perhaps I should have done. Presumably you accept that when carrying out the conduct of prosecutions, Post Office Limited was responsible for conducting them appropriately and lawfully? Absolutely, yes. And as you say, at your executive level, your evidence is that the Post Office Legal Department was responsible for the conduct of those prosecutions. Do you accept that you were ultimately responsible for ensuring that the Post Office Legal Department fulfilled its responsibilities to conduct investigations and prosecutions appropriately and lawfully? I mean, ultimately, as the managing director of that entity, yes. And what steps did you take to see that the prosecutions were conducted appropriately and lawfully? I, I think um, the initial conversations with Sue around the induction to the business gave me a flavour and a, a, a picture. I think the monthly reporting that came in through that <coughs> structure to the exec team to review cases um, but I didn't go beyond that to review the individual cases and the conduct of the cases. Please could we turn up uh, your witness statement, um, page 10, paragraph 24. Now, just before this, we don't need to have it on the screen, you, you say um, that you're responding to a question the inquiry asked concerning risk and compliance issues arising, arising from the prosecution of sub -post <coughs> And in paragraph 24, you say, um, as a Crown Office, Post Office Limited dealt with the per public money and therefore had a responsibility to protect the public purse. And you refer, you, expand on that. Towards the bottom, four lines up, you say, I cannot recall thinking that any risk or compliance issues arose from Post Office Limited undertaking this role, but with the benefit of hindsight and in light of the wrongful prosecutions, I can see the inherent risks in the prosecutions taking place in-house and not by an independent enforcement authority. That can come down, thank you. What do you consider those inherent risks to be? Um, I think that uh, the sort of passage of time has shown that uh, conducting the case, gathering the data, acting as the prosecution um, can lead you to a position where you might not think as independently as you should do about the quality of the information, have you disclosed everything, um, have you uh, presented the case in a balanced way um, and I think those kinds of risks are clearly there. I think the other danger 
is that potentially the balance of probability might have might be stretched too far in terms of whether to take a case through a legal process or not. Um, Can I ask you to expand on what you mean by that? Yeah, so I mean, you, I think you should only take a case on where you think that in layman's terms, you're certain of the facts, you're certain of what the case is, you're certain that somebody's guilty. Um, it is possible, I'm not sure that I ever saw this, but it's possible that, you know, that 100% picture might change. You might take a 90% picture or an 80% picture. Um, I, d I never saw that, but that's the type of risk that I was thinking about when I wrote that comment. Why did it require hindsight to identify those risks? I think at the time I was not focused on the level of controls, the level of risks associated with what we can now see. That's the issue. Um, Why do you think that was? Because if we go back to 2010, as, as you'll see earlier in my statement, the focus of the board and the focus of the business was actually um, almost entirely around the separation of the post office from Royal Mail Group, uh, a new party coming in um, from government, the need to refinance the business, uh, which was fundamental to its long-term existence because it was coming to the end of a funding package with government, um, and more latterly, the Bank of Ireland sort of final knockings of the, of the banking crisis from 2008. And those elements, sad to say, were actually where the board was fundamentally focused through most of the time that I was with the, with the post office. The fact that you didn't identify those risks at the time, what do you think about that now? Well, with hindsight, it's, it's obviously very sad um, because had we identified those risks, we might have been able to put in place better control mechanisms, better inspection mechanisms um, of governance, and we didn't. To what extent do you accept responsibility for not identifying that risk? I certainly think I'm a part of it. Um, the, as I said, the structures were there before I came. They were certainly not changed while I was there. Um, and along with the rest of the executive team, we did review the risk registers. We didn't flag this as a potential new risk to think about. Um, but ultimately, I managed that process. Do you have any insight as to why anyone else in the team didn't identify those risks or present them to you? No. Um, I mean, it's like all risks in a risk register. If, if you ask me, was COVID on that risk register? No, it wasn't. Um, you become aware of things, don't you? And then you react to them. Um, and this is one of those that we didn't pick up at the time and should have done. I oh. just want to be clear about what the should have done um, means in that context, Mr. Smith. And it's a, a theme that has um, uh, surfaced in various forms throughout the inquiry. Uh, and if I can put it in this way, the debate between foresight and hindsight. Yes. My understanding of your evidence is, is this, and please correct me if I'm wrong. All the risks which you have elucidated in relation to paragraph 24 were foreseeable risks at the time. However, because there were other, as you saw it, and I'm not challenging you on this for the moment, more important things to consider in the business, they took up uh, your thought processes rather than the foreseeable risks which you've identified. Is that fair? Yes, I think so. Yeah, fine. Thank you, sir. I, I just want to come, before we move on to a different topic, uh, to the monthly legal reports. You referred to these earlier, and you said that it would include lists of legal cases. Was that lists of all cases that Post Office Limited were involved with in terms of prosecutions? I can't be certain of the detail here because it's a long time ago, but um, I do recall that, as with all the other departments, they were <coughs> written out their performance overview of what's happening 
and inside the legal one would have been a summary of, I think, each of the cases that they were acting on at that point in time and the status of that. And if we needed to talk about them because they were flagged as there's something that needs to be resolved or an issue here, um, then they would have been discussed in the meetings. So you, you said if we needed to talk to, about them because yes. of the flag, can you recall any time when you did talk about them? Um, I, I'm not certain, but I would imagine that we would have talked about the Seaman Misra case, but I'm not certain. We'll come to that um, yes, I'm sure. in due course. So you, you, let's focus back on when you arrived. I want to now look at your knowledge of the IT system. It's probably helpful at this to, point just to cover some terminology. The IT system that was in place between, or used between 2000 and 2010, I'm going to refer to as Legacy Horizon. Okay. Following the group litigation um, use of words. And the version of Horizon that was being brought in when you became managing director, I'm going to refer to that as Horizon Online. Okay. In your statement, you say that um, you were not aware of any bugs, errors, or defects in the Horizon IT system when you joined. I assume that refers to Legacy Horizon. Uh, it, it actually referred to all of it, because when I joined, I didn't really know anything about Horizon other than it was the system that was used to operate the, the business. Did you think that the Horizon IT system would have been completely free of bugs, errors, and defects? By the Horizon system, do you mean legacy or...? Well, let's deal with both. Okay. First, legacy Horizon. So certainly in terms of the legacy system, it had been in for many, many years. Um, I didn't envisage there would be material problems with it at that point, no. In terms of the online system, I was aware that we had been going through pilot very quickly into my ten years. We'll no doubt discuss them in it. Um, I was aware that there were problems with freezing accounts, and it didn't strike me as particularly unusual with a new system coming in for there to be a bug of some sort that needed to be resolved. Um, when you spoke about Legacy Horizon, you referred to material problems. Does that mean you, there may have been some bugs, errors, and defects that were immaterial? There may have been, um, but I didn't, I didn't think that there would have been anything significant, let's put it that way. Uh, in your statement, you also say that you weren't aware of complaints about the integrity of the Horizon IT system when you joined. Yes. When did you become aware of such complaints? I can't be certain, um, but it would have been relatively early on, um, probably through the briefing processes, um, but I can't be certain of that. Can I turn up a document, please? It's UKGI, then there's six zeros, two eight. So this is a uh, letter, it's from Alan Cook on the 13th of October 2009, that's your predecessor, sent shortly, well, half a year before you joined. Yeah, can, can I have a moment to read it, because I've, I've not seen this before today. Have you not? No. Um, yes, of course you can, please do read it. Thank you. Could we move on, please? Okay. If we could go back to the first page, please. 
So we see there's a, a parliamentary question um, that's being responded to. Yeah. It says, to ask the Minister of State, Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, whether he has received reports of errors in the post office horizon system, which have led to postmasters or postmistresses being falsely accused of fraud, and if he will make a statement. And you've read the, the response that's there. Um, that can come down, thank you. Do you remember if you were made aware of that letter uh, during the process of joining? Uh, based on the fact I've never seen it before, I don't think so. As I said, more generally, I was made aware of some of the challenges that Horizon um, had encountered um, through my briefing into, into the business, but not the specifics of that letter, no. I just want to break down those, those challenges. Um, are you referring to challenges in legal cases, including prosecutions? No, I'm really thinking more about I've been made aware of the, um, the Computer Week uh, sort of press type of noise that, that was out there. That's what I'm thinking about. So are you referring to the article by Rebecca Thompson published on the 11th of May 2009? In I believe so, yes. yes. Um, and that article reported on allegations by some postmasters at the time allegations by some postmasters that they had been convicted or held liable on the basis of data generated by the Horizon IT system, which they claim was unreliable. I believe so, yes. What did you make of those, um, those complaints when you first heard about them? Well, I mean, I, I obviously asked about um, why we believed our system was robust. Um, and why we were continuing to be successful through cases, um, uh, the themes of which are not dissimilar to what ultimately came through later in the Rod Ismay report that we'll no doubt get to. Um, so let, let's break that down. You're saying you were <coughs> briefed on these allegations and their complaints, and at that time, at the briefing, you raised questions about how we were certain that the system was robust in in the round yes I didn't this was not a huge probing exercise to, to get to the bottom of every single case this was a okay well why did we think we we're okay kind of conversation um, and that was as far as it went do you remember the response you were given when asked those questions I think it was along the lines of what eventually comes out in the in the Ismay report. In other words, the system's pretty much tamper-proof. Um, we've got strong audit records. Uh, we've got independent security going around checking and balancing. Um, and the court cases that we've held have been largely successful. Um, so it was kind of that level rather than anything more detailed. And who told you that? I think um, I can certainly remember having conversations with Paula. I think I had Sorry. conversations, Paula Venels, and I think I had conversations with Susan Crichton as well. Um, but I can't be certain beyond that. At that point, were you aware of um, any concerns about how the prosecutor... Sorry, I'll start that again. Were you aware um, of complaints about how investigations were handled by Post Office Limited? At that time, no, I don't think so. We're talking about April as part of my induction into the business. Okay, please can we bring up um, POL 20106867. And can we go to page three, please? And down to the email midway, thank you. This uh, is an email on the 26th of February 2010, so before your time, it's from Andy Hayward, who was Senior Fraud Risk Programme Manager in Post Office Limited Security Team. Did you, do you remember working with him? I don't really, know. Now, uh, I think it's important to make one clarification here before we move on. You'll see 
there's a recipient list on the right, and in the CC column it says David X Smith. The inquiry understands that's not you. Correct. That would have been the IT, David. Um, I know you've had a few issues with this over the course, um, but this is not me. No, I was David Y Smith on the on the systems. The email says, um, following our conference call today, below is a brief summary of the agreed activities to progress the next steps in relation to the above piece of work. You see the above piece of work is subject challenges to horizon. Uh, points one, um, it refers to gathering information on past and present cases with reference to the horizon challenges. Point two, is that information security would conduct initial investigations and provide terms of reference outlining remit and requirements to carry out full investigation. And three, subject to agreement of two above, conduct full investigations into integrity issues with conclusions report provided. Once investigated and conclusions drawn, gain external verification to give a level of external gravitas to the response to these challenges. That can come down, thank you. We were aware that Post Office had considered conducting full investigations in response to challenges to Horizon Integrity in February 2010. No. It's clear, isn't it, that those challenges hadn't been resolved by the time you joined as Managing Director? It is now. I'm not sure that it was when I joined. Why do you think you weren't briefed on or told about the, um, that plan to do an investigation? I don't know. I want to move on to look at Horizon Online now, please. Um, can we look at your witness statement, page five, paragraph 11? You said the board was responsible for the rollout of the upgrade of Horizon to Horizon Online, and therefore this was ultimately my responsibility. I feel important to point out that in light of the major issues facing the business outlined above, my primary focus was on keeping the business afloat in a financially precarious time, and as a result of this, and the fact that the rollout was already underway, Horizon Online was a lower priority. I want to explore that. Could we look, please, at poll then four zeros one six one five? This is described as a weekly highlight report. It says forward 1 to 11 program at the top. And it's for the period 9th of April to 15th of April, so when you joined. Uh, you comment on this in your witness statement. Could you just summarise briefly what, what this is? Yeah, there's a change program uh, that was running through the business court. Uh, forward 1 to 11 was the way it was badged. Um, program owner uh, or project sponsor was myself. Program owner was Sue. This is a weekly update to us on the status of each of those programmes, um, one of which was the Horizon rollout. Horizon Online, I should say, sorry. Hey. If we can go to page three, please. Says what did not go so well this week, and um, Horizon Online, the Horizon Online pilot continues to run at 614 branches before the branch migrations remain suspended due to the series of live service interruptions which have occurred since 26 March. And it continues. So you were aware of issues with the Horizon Online rollout? Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, my you know my comment in Paro 11 of my statement doesn't mean I wasn't working on Horizon. I, I was at a 
couple of points, significant points. One of them is here. Um, but relative to other priorities and, and time over the generality of my time in the business, it was a lower priority, but not a zero priority, a lower priority. Can we look at page seven, please? See here, there's a form of risk register. Is yep. And page eleven, please. Horizon Online. We see it's been given a, a red risk. Yep. The. There's a series of crossed out dates, which is the planned dates column, uh, which we see the full rollout commencing has been pushed back and then it's TBA. Could we then go back please to page six? Of new or major risks, AEI product. And this says DVLA Go Live is dependent on HNGX, that's arised online, implementing routers into all required branches by the date agreed with the client. So it's fair, isn't it, that the Horizon Online um, rollout and the delays was having effect on the business across the board. Yes. That document can come down now, thank you. And you were aware of those knock-on effects? Yeah, which is why I said there were a couple of times in my tenure, this being the first of them, where Horizon got high on the priority list. Um, and the challenge here was that we were, we'd rolled out about 600, I think, something like that, um, sites and they were experiencing problems with freezing screens which meant that uh, it was trade affecting so they were not able to transact in the way that they should be able to in a timely manner. Um, we were very well aware that if we could not fix that problem relatively quickly we would have to roll back to the legacy system um, and during the course of my first couple of weeks in the business I uh, had conversations with senior people inside Fujitsu to understand the problem, the fix, the timetable, and to press upon them the importance of um, correctly fixing or giving us a view that we could roll back because we needed to be one or the other. We couldn't have a number of sites that were uh, unable to trade normally. So we'll, we'll look at those discussions in a moment, but. Is your evidence that at the start, Horizon Online was a higher priority? Higher, yes. It still wouldn't have been the number one priority, even at that point, it would have been higher because other people in the business were dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Mike Young, for example, who was running the rollout program. Could we look at FUJ, then two zeros, one seven four two nine two? If we could go down so that the email just below is, is in view. I, thank you. So th this is an email from uh, Gavin Bounds to Roger Gilbert. Uh, and it's on the 9th of April 2010. And it refers to uh, Duncan spoke with the new CEO, David Smith this morning. Yep. Duncan there, Duncan Tate. I assume so. Obviously, this is a Fujitsu email, so I've never seen this before you presented it to me. But I assume so. And 
if it is Duncan Tate, uh, he was managing director of the private sector div division of Fujitsu at that time. I certainly spoke to senior people in Fujitsu at that time. I can't recall exactly who it was. It refers to a, a, it says a constructive session, um, I believe, of course, focused on the issues of the last two weeks. I, I think you've, you may have already answered this, but can you recall this specific phone call? I can recall it. I can recall um, feeling reassured from the call. Um, that Why did you feel reassured? Because they had identified what the issue was. Um, and when you, and so when you say the issue, what, what issue are you is in, As in why the account was freezing. Um, they had a clear plan of action to fix it. Um, and on that basis, assuming that that were to take place, then we would have been back in a sensible place to continue the rollout. And in fact, that's what ultimately happened. At the bottom, you, you can see an email that, that um, is sent which prompts this reply. And that email says, what's the latest on our relationship with the post office? What, were your view of, what was your view of the relationship between Fujitsu and the post office at this time? Um, my view was that um, at a strategic level, the two parties were comfortable. Um, at an operational level, there was certainly pressure to identify and fix this particular problem. Um, and we had explored internally, you know, what options had we got to put additional pressure on them to make sure that they had the right resource and appropriate focus to get it fixed. Um, so at a strategic level, fine. At an operational level, at that point, there were probably tensions between the two groups. Back to the, the, the email we looked at first, after the constructive session, uh, it said, it, but ended with the CEO saying, once we have these issues sorted, we should meet and discuss futures. Do you think that's something you would have said? I might not have said it exactly in those words, but I certainly would have wanted to build a strategic relationship with Fujitsu as a major partner of the business. Uh, that would be typically in any role. So I'd have expected to be seeing them maybe a couple of times a year at a board to board type level. And so that probably would have been what he reflects back here. That can come down. Thank you. Can we turn then please to FUJ two zeros one four two one nine oh and if we can go down to show the sender please apologies catching up in my paper bundle Uh, that letter was, is from uh, Alan Dalvarez, sent on the 8th of April 2010. So a day before your, the conversation we referred to. Did you see this um, report at the time? I don't recall ever seeing it at the time. That's not to say I didn't, but I don't recall seeing it. So it's a draft report prepared by Fujitsu in response to a request by post office regarding a particular technical issue, which we can look at if we go uh, over the page, please. It says, background, during branch trading statement. Pausing there, what does branch trading statement mean to you? Um, at the end of a, a cycle, they would print out effectively a balance to say this is what we transacted in the period. And it refers to the trial report uh, that allows the postmaster to check that the data is correct, and the final report, um, which was printed off and, and kept in the office. Uh, the final report was an important document, wasn't it? I believe so. Do you know, do you know why? Well, I do now, because I've read all of the papers. At the time, I wasn't really aware of the the day-to-day -day mechanics of what happened at each site. The problem description says, on the final report, 
the stock holding figures in the second section of the report are incorrect on the final balance. And Fujitsu went on to state that the error affected the printed final account, but not the database itself. That can come down for the time being, please. This is different from the screen freezing issue you refer to in your witness statement. Indeed, and wasn't what I was talking to um, Fujitsu about. I was talking to him about screen freeze. Were you made aware of this issue? I don't believe so, no. Could we look, please, at FUJ three zeros nine five six two eight? And if we could go to page three, please. Page two, page two, sorry, you, yeah, there we go, thank you. So we see that this is a, an email from Duncan Tate on the 10th of May. It's internal to Fujitsu, so you wouldn't have seen it at the time. Sorry, was there an answer there? I'm sorry? Sorry, I'm just wondering if the witness is sometimes nodding or shaking. I see. Uh, the witness neither neither shook his head or said. Uh, uh, but I didn't, but I, I I didn't say question. anything. Was it, was there a question? <laughs> there wasn't a question. Okay. Um, so I, no, 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 no problem. <laughs> if we uh, look, at, it says Roger. I spoke to Mike Young on Friday morning, which would be the seventh of May, two thousand and ten, based on this um, email. Uh, he said he made the following points. Uh, the programme was reviewed at group level uh, outside the post office by Royal Mail Board with Mike Young, Dave Smith, brackets, new POMD, and the group legal counsel and FD discussing options. Do you recall that meeting? I don't specifically, I'm afraid, no. And it states in the paragraph with the bullet points, their confidence has been knocked due to, one, ongoing issues with Oracle stability impacting HNGX stability. Was that a matter that you were aware of? That, uh, that is what I think of as the freeze account. I think that's what that means, or that's what it meant to me at the time. Uh, the data center outage? I was aware there had been problems with uh, uptime at the data center, yes. And the outage caused by Fujitsu operator error last week, which I'm, caused... I'm not really sure I was aware of that one. We then look to a, f a series of requests that, uh, that uh, Mr. Young made. Uh, if we go down to the numbers, thank you. So based on advice from group legal counsel, Mike feels he wants some assurance that the PNL for the account is sustainable over the short and long term so they can see we can invest and provide the resources necessary to get the problems fixed. This will look like some form of an open book arrangement. Do you remember that request being made? Um, not directly as in, in here, um, but context wise, as I said earlier, we were aware that it was important for us to either move forwards or roll back because of the trade affecting issues. I was aware from the briefings I'd had that contractually we had limited options to push them to move forwards or back um, and the list that we have here I think is a sort of considered view as to what might what levers might we be able to pull in order for Fujitsu to move at the speed that we were hoping that they would move either forwards or back um, but beyond that no. What does an open book arrangement mean to you? Well, what it actually means is that they share their financial position in relation to the contract so that we could see whether it's making a profit or a loss. The concern that was, I think, uh, at the time was that we were moving from the old contract to a new one. 
and part of the rationale for moving to Horizon Online as well as the benefits of cloud and the benefits of uh, simpler systems was that we would have less complex estate to manage and therefore there would be a lower cost. And wh what we were concerned about was have we actually extracted too much cost reduction from Horizon, uh, from Fujitsu for the new Horizon version um, and they can no longer make money so therefore they're not going to put the effort in to put it right. That was the, the thread. Number two says he wants an independent review of the processors, tools and resource on the program to assure themselves we are genuinely up to it. Do you remember that as a request? Not specifically worded like that, but I do recall the conversation that was saying, are we sure they have enough resource to deliver this in the timescales that we need? We're requesting an independent review. It's strong, yes. It's strong. Yes. I don't think anybody would have expected them to agree to that. We wouldn't have done in reverse, but this is us looking at ways to negotiate to get the product to where it needed to be as quickly as possible. Were you aware of the, the plan to ask for an independent review? I'm not certain. I probably would have been, but I'm not certain. As you said, it's a very significant issue. Yes. Um, this reports that it was a call with Mike Young following a discussion at group level, which includes you. <coughs> you say you're, it may have happened, you're not certain. How confident or unconfident are you that you would have been aware? Well, un unfortunately, it's, look, it's 14 years ago and I just can't remember the meeting. Um, I think it sounds like I would have known about it and should have known about it. So it's likely that I would have known, but I'm not certain. Before going to three, I, I want to come back to something you said. Uh, how, what did you think was the likelihood of Fujitsu agreeing to an independent review? I don't think we thought it was likely at all. I think what we thought it would do was focus their minds to complete the um, fix that was needed from the freeze of accounts to enable us to then continue with the rollout. On what basis did you think that they, it was unlikely that they would agree? Well, I, I was just looking at it in reverse, and I think um, you know we had no contractual right to insist on it. Um, if they believed that they were going to deliver the program, then why would they want anybody else to look at it? Um, was kind of the thinking that I got. And if the boot had been on the other foot, I don't think we as an organisation, as in Royal Mail Group or Post Office Limited, would have accepted a third party reviewing our programme of activity either. So if we look below three, where it says, my view is it will be difficult based upon where we are now for us to resist two, one and two, two being the independent review, there is some risk in those areas. That was against what your assessment of the situation was? That was their internal view. We never saw that um, and wasn't what we were thinking. Three, uh, he says he wants Dave Smith uh, to have some dialogue with Richard C. That's presumably Richard Christou. I would assume so, yes. I don't know, but I would assume so. So they can test the Japanese board commitment to the account and programme. Conference call or VC would work. Do you remember that um, being requested as I, well? I remember that, and I also remember attempts to set up that call um, and Certainly a call did take place at some point, but when it was, I can't remember exactly. Do you remember what was said on that call? Only that we were concerned about the um, elements and um, were pleased to see that they'd moved forwards and progressed them. And I think because the call would have taken place sometime after the program had started to roll out again. Um, if we could please go to FUJ 3095658. So it's a, a letter of the same day, 10th of May, 2010. Uh, this is from Mike Young to Duncan Tate. You don't need to go through all of the letter. It, it covers very similar ground. But if we could go to the bottom of that page, please.
on the uh, second sentence, it says, we would, we would very much like to see the executive correspondence within Fujitsu relating to the recent red alert. This, we feel, would give us an understanding of how the executive management within Fujitsu are aware and responding to some of the problems we have seen in rollout. In your experience, is the, that request for our executive correspondence a standard one? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's a standard one. I, I, I certainly have used similar tactics to uh, get suppliers to move in the directions we wanted to in, in other organisations, but um, it's not standard, no. Why did Post Office want to see that, um, or did you expect to be able to see that correspondence? No. I mean, again, it goes back to we were looking for levers to ensure that they were moving forward with the programme because we either needed to revert back or to the old leg legacy system or move forwards. We couldn't stay where we were. And at this stage, had the relationship with Fujitsu and Post Office, had that changed since when you first joined? I don't believe so. Not at not a, a, a macro strategic level. I don't think it had. We're going to come back to that theme, but I want to keep, stay chronologically for, for the time being. Um, unless so, it may, it may be a good time to break looking at the time. Um, yeah, fine there, Mr. Stevens. When should we resume? Uh, should we say 25 past, sir? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you.
So can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. I'll carry on. Um, please, can we bring up UKGI three zeros one six one one nine? This is a letter to Sir Edward Davey, uh, then MP and Minister for Postal Affairs, from Alan Bates on the 20th of May 2010. Were you aware of the JFSA, the Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance, at, uh, when you were, had joined or in the early days of Post Office Limited? Uh, when I joined, no. Um, relatively quickly thereafter, I. I would say yes, but I can't recall exactly when. But yes, I was aware of it. If we could look at the, third, the fourth paragraph, please. And the last sentence says, though an independent external investigation instigated at ministerial level would be the most appropriate, and without any doubt easily find evidence of the error-ridden system. Had you seen this letter um, to Ed Davey at the time or when you were managing director of post office? I think at the time the letter was written not directly. I'm pretty sure though that in the correspondence in sort of July time from Biz, it would have been part of the bundle of papers that would have come across from Oliver Griffiths, I think. He was saying essentially um, we're getting some um, inbound queries that you need to address, essentially, is what you're saying. So I think I had seen it at some point, but not exactly at the date when it's dated here. Uh, please, can we bring up POL 20417098. And page five, please. <laughs> This is a letter in response. It's it, hard to see, but it, it looks like it will be 21st of May 20, uh, 2010. Uh, it says, thank you for your letter of 20th May, requesting to meet to discuss the post office horizon system. Since 2001, when the Royal Mail, um, which included Post Office Limited, was set up as a public limited company with the government as its only shareholder, the government has adopted an arm's length relationship with the company so that it had the commercial freedom to run its business operations without interference from the shareholder. The integrity of the Post Office Horizon system is an operational and contractual matter for Post Office Limited and not government. Whilst I do appreciate your concerns and those of the Alliance members, I do not believe a meeting would serve any useful purpose. Uh, that government position, um, that these Horizon issues were an operational matter for Post Office Limited, is that something in which you were consulted whilst you were managing director? I was certainly um, having conversations with both Biz and shareholder executive um, as sort of preparation and briefing notes um, for the minister coming in. Um, I'm not certain exactly of when and how those meetings would have taken place, but there would have been a number of conversations either from myself or my team with Biz to help prepare the response for the Minister. So, yes, I suppose is the answer. Were you happy with that approach? Uh, as it stood there, yes, based on what we knew at the time, yes. Please, could we bring up RMG 50139? This is a report that you gave to the Royal Mail Holding Board. Um, it says May 2010, but over the, uh, at the end we don't need to go there. We'll see it's dated June 2010. Could we look at the bottom of the first page, please? Three refers to a meeting with yeah. Edward Davy MP. And if you could just read that paragraph to yourself. Do 
Do you recall if you discussed the Horizon IT system at this meeting? I can't recall specifics of uh, the meeting in great detail, to be fair. Um, I mean, the minutes there probably give you the the summary of the key things that were discussed. I think it's possible that we could have discussed it, but I can't be sure. Before the break, we discussed that Post Office was seeking an independent review of Horizon Online. Did you tell him about that position? No, I think what we were talking about, if we were talking at all, would have been that by the time we're talking here, we're in early June, I think, that the rollout had now recommenced and that we were on track to complete it sometime in the autumn, probably September, October time. So the, the events of the previous couple of months ago had resolved themselves. So I don't think we would have spent time talking about that particular issue. Well, let's, let's look at that. Um, can we go to FUJ three zeros? Nine six three one two, please. If we could go right to the bottom of the first page, please. This is an email. Um, Duncan Tate to uh, Mike Young on the 29th of June 2010. So after your meeting with Ed, Ed Davey. If you could carry on please into the body of the email. The third paragraph, it says, since your letter, they're referring back to the letter of the 10th of May from Mike Young, which we looked at before the break, in which um, a request for an independent review was, was uh, referred to. So I'm extremely pleased with the progress that has been made. We have located the source of the troubles and taken steps to rectify the issues, and we have now recommenced the pilot. Currently counters running on HNGX stand at just under 20% of the estate. We are now rolling out at about the maximum levels originally envisaged, with no further sign of the problems that initiated our discussions. Um, tuning will continue, and we expect to emerge from the pilot with high levels of confidence um, for the remainder of the deployment. It goes on to refer to the deficiencies in the, um, in the product code And if we turn to uh, Mike Young's email at the top, please, at page one. <coughs> this is on the 30th of June, so the day after. And it says, on the issue of having a qualified independent party audit to evaluate Fujitsu program execution, along with staffing level and skill base, I had been briefed that you had spoken to several entities to pursue this endeavor. Indeed, I was told you were close to agreeing terms with one of these. Additionally, in our calls, you will recall I asked whether there was a possibility of the post office owning the terms of reference again. This was something that you were going to strongly consider. As it stands now, I feel I've been led down journey on a, of a number of months just so that you can now say no. This does not reflect well on our relationship and will not be well received in the next review. I have, a, as a matter of course, been keeping both the post office executive um, and the group executive aware of the progress I was told we were making in these areas. Um, so is it fair to say, at, following your meeting with Ed Davey on the 30th of June, the Post Office was still seeking to pursue an independent review of Horizon Online? I, I'm not certain, to be honest. I, um, 
I can't recall the details here. Um, I do know that we were at this point somewhere around 2,000 sites rolled out from the sort of 600 back in April and that the plan was on track to complete the rollout in the autumn. Um, so from that perspective, the imperative of, of uh, meeting and forcing the review had, had diminished somewhat, but I can't, I can't recall the detail. Well, the, the email from Duncan Tate says, at this crucial phase of the programme, we can see no benefit and will not be pursuing a third party review. That's quite stark, isn't it? Yes, it is. And you can't recall what your you can't recall what you thought you made of that. Well, I think I can't recall the detail of this specific email uh, exchange, but I can recall that at that point in time we were rolling forwards again at pace, um, and that had had that to continue, which it did, then we would have been content um, to have completed the rollout. I take it you don't recall. Um, anything further what happened after this email? No, I'm sorry, I don't. I mean, this would be more in Mike Young's um, space because he was managing the day-to-day -day relationship here. Well, looking at this now, what, how did this affect, or did it have any effect on your relation, on the relationship between Fujitsu and Post Office Limited? I don't think at the time I was viewing it particularly different from where I was in April. Um, what I had seen was a conversation high up into Fujitsu with myself, following which there was action. The programme did start rolling out again and, and actually completed later in the autumn. So at that level, um, the relationship was okay. Can we go to POL 404669? Thank you. This is a letter uh, that's addressed to you um, from Pamela Stubbs on the 5th of June 2010. And I think in your witness statement you say you don't recall having received this letter. That's correct. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, it says that I'm writing as a sub-postmistress who's worked for the post office for some 23 years and who has been in charge of this office for 11 years since my husband's death. During this time, I've had very few problems with the work involved in running the office. However, all that changed when I moved from my old building into a porter cabin for the duration of the demolition and rebuild of the new shop and office. Almost from the day that my horizon system was relocated into the porter cabin, my office balances were short by thousands of pounds in each trading period. So I flagged a beach shortage with a helpline, particularly after Christmas 2009 trading, when the office was short by some 9,000 pounds, even though I'd only been open for two and a half weeks. No help or advice was forthcoming, and so I decided on my own that I would print off transaction logs for every week to enable me to make some sense of these losses. Later on in the fourth paragraph, he says, I have had an order to monitor me at work. He checked my cash, did a cash declaration, watched every transaction for a morning's work. At the end, he produced another cash declaration, which showed on Horizon, at least, the office had lost 190 pounds. If we could go over the page, please. <coughs> Final paragraph says, I sincerely hope that you will be able to intervene in this matter, since I am of the opinion that no one will actually look at Horizon in an impartial way, unless directed by a person of authority at the top of Post Office Limited. That can come down, thank you. We don't need to go there. You know in your note in your witness statement that this letter was acknowledged on 8th of June 2010 by Simon Smith, um, who was in the executive correspondence team. You're nodding yes. Yes, sorry. Yes. Uh, how was the... Um, can you just describe how the executive correspondence team was made up? Uh, there was a senior lead person um, who ran a team of, I can't remember the exact number, but say three to five people, that sort of size. 
um, and in keeping with many large organisations, letters that would come in for the senior team, for the chair, for the chief exec or the MD, would generally be dealt with by that team. Um, they would have the uh, power and responsibility to inquire into different parts of the business to enable them to write an appropriate response. Uh, and generally they would judge whether that would need to come across my desk um, to review um, and then sign off. Um, firstly, who was responsible for overseeing that team? I think at that time, and I'm, I apologise, I may have this not right, but I think it was Mike Granville who ran the overall team. And then I think it was Michelle, uh, was it Graves, under him, who was actually running the day-to-day -day of the activity. But presumably if this team was um, preparing correspondence to be sent out in response to letters to you, yep. you would have had some oversight of it? Absolutely. They physically sat about where this team is here, so they went far away. So they always had the opportunity to say, have a look at this, what do you think about this kind of thing. But uh, in this particular instance, I don't recall anything about it, unfortunately. And you said in your witness statement, we don't need to go there, you say, if appropriate, the answer um, to a bit of correspondence might appear on your desk to look at. Yes. Um, what type of correspondence would they put on your desk? Um, I would have thought um, letters from MPs, for example. I remember seeing a letter from David Cameron as an example. I think I've mentioned that in the statement. Um, uh, that type of thing would come across my desk, but generally 80 or 90%, I'm guessing, probably wouldn't have done. So was it linked to the perceived importance of the person rather than the importance no, of the No, it was, a, it was a, a judgment of both. A judgment of both. <coughs> to what extent did you set parameters or give them guidance on what correspondence should be directed to you? I don't think I did because that was already in existence before I joined and I let it run as it was running. And do you know what that guidance specifically said, or was it just in accordance with the evidence you've given? I don't know, I'm sorry. So is it the case that complaints such as um, the one we just went to, those wouldn't be passed to you as a matter of course? Not necessarily, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have always come to me, no. Please could we look at POL 20106847? And if we could go to page 13 at the bottom, please. So we see the start of an email at the bottom from Mark Dinsdale on the 14th of September 2010. And you clarified evidence this is about the time that you were um, considering leaving post office. You're nodding yes. Yes, sorry. Uh, over the page, please. It says, this is quickly, be uh, oh, I should say, sorry, it refers to the um, Barkham Post Office, which is what, what we're considering here. Right. So this is quickly turning into a bit of a problem. This is a potential fraud where losses occurred when an SBMR moved into a port cabin but ceased the moment she was suspended and somebody else run the office. Uh, firstly, do you know, well, was it usual for complaints such as this still to be uh, investigated and not responded to months after they were made? I can't comment in, in general terms, but I would have expected at least an initial response to say we are investigating it. Um, as I said earlier, that was done on the 8th of June. Yes. I'm, I'm talking about a, a, a finished, investigated response. What? Sorry, repeat the question. I'm not quite sure. Of course. Um, to what extent was it usual for the executive correspondence team to take several months to come back with a substantive response to a complaint such as the one we saw earlier? I, I don't know. It would have depended upon the nature of the issue and what needed to be done to investigate it. but. Um, in this particular case, they're obviously investigating deeply what happened, so I'm not surprised it took a while to respond. In the fourth paragraph, 
uh, or maybe or the last paragraph. Uh, it says, this now leaves us in a difficult situation with the SPMR writing letters to Dave Smith, her MP, and no doubt countless other people, this is high profile. She has also joined the SPMR's fight to question the integrity of Horizon. It being described as high profile, do you think this is something that would have come across your desk um, at any point? I don't know. It, I, would have, I would have hoped so, but I don't know that it did. Please could we turn to FUJ 20121097. And page two, please. If you go to the bottom, please. It's an email from Penny Thomas, yeah, Fujitsu, um, to post office, uh, members of the post office. Do you recall any of those people on the uh, send line? Uh. Sue and Mark, I certainly remember being in the business. I'm not exactly sure what their job titles were at the time, but they would have been relatively senior management, I would have thought. It says, we've identified that a number of recent ARQ returns contain duplicated transaction records. Uh, would you have known at the time what ARQ data was? I'm not sure I would have done, no. Do you now know what it is now? I understand it's a data log data pool of all the detail of the transactions from the branch account. And that is the basis on which that, uh, the data with which that post office will pursue prosecutions in some understand, cases. yes. Um, so the issue of there being duplicated transaction records within that, would you accept that's a significant problem? I would. Is this something you were briefed on? No, I'm not aware of it. Why do you think that important information like that wasn't getting to you? I don't know. I can't say. Please could we turn to poll 00417098, please. And page 13, please. This is a document referring to a parliamentary question asked by Priti Patel on the 6th of July 2010 um, to ask the Secretary of State, Department for Business, Innovations and Skills, <coughs> what is the most recent estimate of cost of postmasters and sub-postmasters of errors in the horizon operating system um, and if you'll make a statement and that um, uh, the department asked you to respond to uh, Priti Vitel in a, a letter yes thank you. No, thank you what did you think your personal obligation was when writing to MPs such as Priti Patel to respond to questions uh, the same as it would have been to anybody else, uh, to respond in a factually accurate way with what I understood to be the, the position. Could we look at your letter and response, please? It's poll 401762. Now, if we can go down to try to get as much of the letter in as, as we can, please. We see at the bottom that it says GRO, which is a, a redaction, but this was a letter that was signed by you, wasn't it? Yes, I do agree with that. In your witness statement, we don't need to turn it up, um, at paragraph 70 um, you say that I am confident that I would have not have written my response without being satisfied at the time with what we were saying and based on the provision of relevant information how did you satisfy yourself that the information in the letter was accurate 
Um, the, le the letter itself would have been drafted by Mike Granville um, his, and his team would have done the usual uh, internal review processes, so that's the first thing to say. Um, the position with Horizon at the time was that we were back to rolling out the system, so I was comfortable that the system was okay. Um, I had obviously got the legal processes and reports from Sue and team giving me an indication of the status of each of the legal reports um, and uh, overall um, I was comfortable at that time that the system was robust uh, and couldn't be accessed because of the sort of tamper proof logs and backdoor system protections and the internal audit team's work and security team's work that was going on in the generality. So that was that was the backdrop in my mind as to why I was comfortable to stand behind a set of statements like these. So you didn't make any particular um, investigations in response? Not specifically to this, um, but you'll see later on that obviously I then uh, did look for an internal review. We'll come to that yeah. um, shortly. You also said you didn't draft the letter, it was put on your desk effectively. Yes. Could we look, please, at you? It's a letter I showed you earlier, and unfortunately you hadn't seen it before, but you, you had a chance to read it earlier. Um, UKGI 6028, please. And can we look at that side by side, please? <coughs> so if we look at, on the... Is the letter to Mr Newmark MP on the left and the um, letter to Priti Patel MP on the right, the first paragraph after the question uh, says the Horizon Computer as Accounting System operates in around 12,000 post office branches and processes up to 250, tran sorry, 750 transactions a second at peak times. If you just read those letters to to yourself, the letter to Priti Patel MP is effectively taken from this earlier one from Alan Cook. It does look very similar, yes. Were you aware at the time that um, people such as Alan Bates were complaining that the response that was coming from post office on complaints was like a template, the same response? No, I wasn't. Um, and obviously I'd not, as I said to you earlier, I'd not seen this letter before today, but it is clearly quite shocking. Those can come down, thank you. I'm now going to come to the investigation you referred to. Um, you've already mentioned the shareholder executive, just for background, would you accept if it, that it, that was a government body um, which managed the government shareholder relationship with businesses such as post office? Yes, that's a basic description, yes. Could we look at poll 20417098, please? If we can go to the email at the bottom, please. It's an email from Oliver Griffiths at Shareholder Executive. Do you recall dealing with him? Yes. Um, he would have been a regular contact of mine through my time in role um, and was generally a liaison point between the post office and the shareholder executive. So this was sent on the 21st of July to, to you, and it says, as we discussed briefly on Monday evening, there has been recent interest from MPs in purported cases where the Horizon system was, has left sub-postmasters out of pocket. Do you recall that discussion? Uh, not, not now, I don't, but I'm sure it took place. It says, we have to date said that this is an operational matter for Paul, Post Office Limited, and resisted calls to impose a review of Horizon. The email goes on to say, um, we are in theory happy to continue holding this line, 
Uh, but if we do so, and it turns out that there have been problems with Horizon, then there will be significant political heat. Grateful, therefore, if you could let me know how confident Post Office Limited is that there is nothing behind these claims. Could we then please look at poll 201700. And Please, could we go to the third page? <coughs> and uh, further down, please. So, th th thank you. Um, we have an email from you, David uh, Y. Smith, 21st of July 2010, at uh, four minutes past seven. So, that's after the email from shareholder executive. Yes. And you say further to yesterday's complaint around Horizon from Oliver and a parliamentary question to Ed Davey from Priti Patel on the same issue. We have today been notified that Channel 4 will run a news item on the same issue. Um, this may be all the same group of people and may also just be a function of the new rollout. However, Sue Higgins will lead our response via Mary to the specific request. But I want an internal investigation under Mike Moore's lead, please, over the next week on the following. Um, this was, you sent this the day after responding to Priti Patel. Why did you now think you needed an investigation but you didn't when you responded to Priti Patel? I was really uh, in my mind responding to Oliver asking for um, essentially a stress test that we were comfortable with what we were saying. Um, what, um, what came out of Oliver's piece was a set of conversations inside the business um, and I wanted to make sure that we had got documented you know why did we think the system was robust what did we think the issues were or went and how were we comfortable that um, the challenges that were being presented in the Channel 4 program particularly um, and in the uh, issues flagged again by um, by Oliver were actually being correctly addressed. So it was really the Oliver email to me that made me think, actually, I probably should look more deeply here than we have done so far. But why didn't that spring to mind when responding to a member of parliament? Well, because the uh, work that had been done previously, as I'd outlined, gave me comfort that what we were saying in that letter was true. I still believed it was true, but I wanted to be able to give the shareholder executive the same confidence that we had got by pulling out the data that said, look, this is why we, this is why we believe um, that our systems are robust. So were you, you were looking to give confidence to the shareholder executive? Yes, yes. The queries you ask, um, the first is how robust is Horizon? Now, below that, there then appears to be an answer. Uh, if we go to the first page, please, of the document, we see there's um, an email from Mark Burley. You're not included in the list, but it yeah. says, I've added some specific comments against the questions from David Smith below, and I would also add the following. So do I take it that the answers to your questions weren't in your original email? Absolutely not. Now, my email, I know I've seen previously there weren't terms of reference for the ISMO report, but my email was essentially the terms of reference. Here's the questions that I think we should be answering. Um, to give us confidence to, or to give the shareholder executive confidence in what we're saying. Could so, the, so this set here that you see here is after that has happened and people are starting to annotate their answers to the emails. Can we turn to page five, please? Uh, 
and if we could go down to the bottom. The penultimate paragraph, it says, how do we treat discrepancies? Is there any exceptional circumstance applied where we don't seek recovery of funds, prosecution, etc.? i.e. are we heavy handed and disproportionate in our response? And then over the page, ah, sorry to page, thank you. The top, it says, how many have we prosecuted? What is our success rate? Why did you seek answers to these questions? I wanted to understand um, if the process that we were going through was fair, I suppose. Um, in other words, had we got the right judgment of we got the right evidence and we were prosecuting correctly. Um, and I was looking for not just an internal measure, but for instance, what was the same situation that was going on in the banking world where cash would be handled in a similar way. So I was trying to verify and give an external benchmark, if you will, um, that the rate of prosecutions that were taking place inside the business were not out of line with what you might expect for any environment where there's a lot of cash around. Well, that's, that's the rate of prosecutions. Um, what about the question, how do we treat discrepancies? Is there any exceptional circumstance applied where we don't seek recovery of funds prosecution, i.e., are we heavy-handed and disproportionate in our response? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to find out the answer to that question because I wanted to ensure that we were um, acting fairly. Why, um, well, if we go to, actually on the uh, page uh, seven, please, if we could just go down um, to the bottom. Thank you. It says, suggest we need input from Lynn, Keith, Woolard, uh, Rod, and Leslie as a minimum. Were any of those people in the legal department? I can't, I can't tell you. Leslie was IT. Um, I can't remember Lynn. Um, Rod was obviously Rod Ismay, who was in the finance world. And I'm not sure what Keith's role was. So I don't know is the answer. Why weren't you getting this type, the questions you're asking, why weren't you getting this type of information from your weekly executive team meetings? Um, in the weekly executive team meeting, we were just looking at the cases that were live at any point in time. Um, so we were not looking at general trends and um, prosecution rates versus other companies and many of those types of things. Um, so they, it wasn't visible. The requests you made here at this stage, would you have discussed this in the executive team meeting? Yeah. The, the, the genesis of what came out here is really a combination of the request from Oliver, um, which we've discussed, the um, board discussions that would have been taking place at the time around the questions from Channel 4, um, which were, we were being asked about. Um, and more generally myself trying to get a balance and sense of, well, if I were outside of this organisation, what would I want to know that would give me comfort, comfort that we are following due process? So as a combination of those, and unfortunately in the midst of time, I haven't got any way of saying this came from here and this came from here and that came from there, but the genesis of this and ultimately the ISMA report that comes from it is effectively that set of activity that was taking place in that period of time. You referred to conversations with the board about the Channel 4 um, the proposed programme. Um, can you recall the detail of any of those conversations? Um, not specifics. Um, in the generality, as a business, and I'm talking about Royal Mail Group here, any items of PR would have been dealt with by the group's PR function, and uh, I think it was Mary Fagan <laughs> probably at the time. Uh, and so they would have taken the overall control of how that process was to be handled. Um, a set of questions, I think, did come in from Channel 4 for us to respond to, some of which would have ended up being in 
the summary of, of what we just looked at. Um, and I know that at a sort of weekly and monthly sort of cadence, we would have been generally talking about PR issues in the round because, as I'm sure you're well aware, the post office and Royal Mail more generally is pretty much in the news all the time and therefore there's always a, an eye on what is going on from a PR perspective. So that's, it would have been in that sort of context that we'd have had a conversation. So was the real trigger for this in your email Channel 4's involvement? No, I think it was a combination of, in my mind, as I've said in, in here, in my mind it was Oliver was the specific trigger, but if we look at what was happening in the round at the time, there are a number of elements that come together that ultimately give us the, albeit brief, terms of reference that we're using to pull together a summary. And, and essentially what I'm thinking about in my head at the time is I'm trying to stress test what people are telling me so that I've got confidence and so that Shex have got confidence in our position. If we could bring back the last documents again, please. It's POL 0041710. And if we could turn to page nine, please. An email from Paul Budd to you and Sue Higgins, and uh, below it says uh, it, it provides a draft of a response to Channel 4. Yes. If you could just move down to see the response, please. Now, reading that, um, was. Did you. Um, did you approve of the message that was set out in this draft? Uh, I don't know that I physically approved it. Um, certainly it would have uh, resonated as the house, the house position, the business position at the time as to what we thought about the system. Um, we didn't know what post office, uh, what Channel 4's programme was actually going to say, so it was difficult to be more specific than that. Um, but that was, that was generally accepted as the position of the business at the time. In your statement, uh, you refer to having a conversation about the questions uh, and being taken through them. Yes. Uh, following that conversation, what were your views on the robustness of the Horizon IT system? Um, so the, the I th can you point me at where in my statement? Of course, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I just want to be certain before I answer. Um, if we turn to paragraph 73, please. Thank you. Yeah. So you say my email address to Mike Young, Sue Higgins and Mike Moores. Yeah. Um, that was the email we are just referring to. And it looks on the email that we met and chatted to work our way through our responses. Yeah. Due to the passage of time, I cannot say why these particular questions laid out in my email were asked, uh, but they are likely to be a combination of whatever I was asking. Okay. Yeah, I understand the context of the question. So this is um, me sitting down with the senior members of the team. Um, Mike Moore has been the CFO, the finance director. Sue, who is responsible for essentially the operation of Horizon day to day. And Mike Young, the head of IT. And we were discussing the framing of what we wanted to do in terms of the review. So that's what I meant by that. Um, what we were not doing was discussing all of the detail of each of the individual components of what our um, position would be. So in, in other words, we didn't have a long conversation about, for instance, Fujitsu's control systems or those types of things. That came afterwards when the Ismay report was written. Uh, well, let's, so, this is, so this is more about conversation about how do we set up the review. Well, let, let's look at that. Um, that document can come down, thank you. 
you, we, the inquiry refers to, and you refer to, the, the Ismay report. That's referring to a report uh, made by Roderick Ismay on the 2nd of August 2010 called Horizon Response to Challenges Regarding System Integrity. When do you think you provided, um, or when would you think Mr Ismay was instructed to prepare that report? I can't remember the exact date, but it certainly would have been very soon after that set of emails we've just looked at. So within a day or two, I would have thought. You accept that there were no written terms of reference? Not specifically, no. They're only the conversations that we would have had and also the email that we just looked at that laid out the questions from the Channel 4 piece. Why weren't there written terms of reference for such an important report? I don't know. Um, and obviously, looking later on in my statement, I reflect back that that's um, a, a mistake. Uh, can we look at, please, page 29 of your statement, paragraph 82. You refer to the um, terms of reference. Oh, sorry, I'm going too fast. You refer to the terms of reference in the first few sentences and then in the middle. You say, I also believe that I spoke with Roddy's May to further explain the context of the request for him to carry out a review. Uh, I cannot say for definite, but I expect that I asked him to produce an answer for Parliament and to provide a response to the Channel 4 news item. And therefore, I wanted to get something to get something which could quickly but effectively confirm what our position was and if incorrect what should that sentence finish there uh no it looks like a mistake and, and if it was incorrect to flag back what we needed to be aware of i think uh, why did you have a conversation with mr ismay and not why wasn't that delegated to one of your um the people in your line i, I think um I think the structure of the time was that Mike Moores, I actually, it was Mike I had charged with writing the report. Um, and that between Mike and myself and Mike Young and Sue, we go back to that conversation, we agreed that it would be appropriate for Rod to carry out the actual activity. Um, and Mike, myself and Mike Young, all at various times did have conversations with Rod um, uh, to sort of set the tone of what we wanted and expected to come back and, and also to help and review with progress. And that was more the two mics than myself, but the three of us, it wasn't just one conversation, it was a set of conversations. So your evidence is that he was, Mr. Ismay was getting instructions from multiple people at multiple times? No, he was getting instructions from me at the start. He was then getting input and guidance on you know, where, where information might be, how to get it, how to pull it together, um, and what the summary and structure of the report might best be presented like to present it back in a coherent way. And what would you have said to him in your instructions? I would have said um, that the um, uh, BIS team have requested that we pull together a, a stress test report, summary report, to review why and how we consider our um, horizon system to be robust. And uh, in order to do that, I'd like you to also consider the types of questions that are here from the Channel 4 investigation. Um, I want you to look across the whole organisation. Um, I want you to pull in whatever resources you need to pull this together. I want you to liaise with Mike Moores, Mike Young and Sue um, to uh, assist you in pulling that together. And then I'd like you to uh, report back. Um, the board wants an honest view. It doesn't want a view that is one-sided. It just wants a view of what you see, what you know. Um, and we need it in a couple of weeks' time as a first view because we are being asked to report back to Shex. I think that was would have been the shape of it. And why, so that, if that's the instruction you gave, why was Rod Ismay the man for the job? 
Rod was um, highly thought of in the business. Um, he had held a number of senior management positions right across a lot of the organisation. So uh, he ran internal audit for a period of time. He had responsibility for security for a period of time. And at that particular point in time, he was running the back office accounting teams. Um, he was a qualified auditor. Um, having come to us from Ernst & Young, he was highly respected across the business. Um, and as I had charged Mike Moores, um, he was a reporting to Mike. Um, so that, that was the set of reasons why we chose him. What about his IT experience? No, he wasn't an IT expert, but I wasn't asking him to audit the IT system. I was asking him to give me the rationale as to why the business thought that we were confident and comfortable in the assertions that we were making. And I was asking him to talk to the relevant experts across the business. So he had Mike Young and team, for instance, Leslie Sewell, to talk to from an IT perspective just like he had Sue Crichton from a legal perspective, just like he had uh, other experts from the business to be involved in. And I think you can see in the, in the sort of summary of the report that comes back, it's an extensive list right across the organisation that input into the report, um, because no one person could have written it anyway. So I think you, you just said that you were looking for the rationale for why the business was confident in its position. Yeah, that, that is essentially the um, exam question that we were being asked by um, Oliver at, she at um, Shareholder Exec. Could we look at Mr Ismay's statement, please? Um, it's WITN 04630100, page 10, paragraph 39. Mr. Ismay, in his written evidence um, to the inquiry, um, says that De um, after being asked by David Smith to conduct a review in light of the challenges being made about the system, it was a summary of existing conclusions, not a fresh investigation. The conclusions came from internal discussions with recipients of the document or, having their, um, or with their team members that they recommended to be, be consulted, including IT. Do you agree with that? Broadly, that sounds right, yes. Can we turn to paragraph 41, please? It says, the report was requested, and I wrote it, in an environment where challenges were made about Horizon, but there was no ready document available which pulled together reasons for assurance. Do you agree with that? I think that's true as well, yes. And were you asking Rod Ismay to produce that document? I was asking him to give me, as I already discussed, um, a stress test report on why we believed that we um, were confident in our assertions that the system was fine. They're separate things, aren't they? One is finding a report which gives reassurance and drafting a report for why there is reassurance and a stress test or investigation into whether something does have integrity. Yeah, I mean, at, at, at the level of doing a full audit review, yes, of course there is. Um, in the time scale that we were talking about here, which is a sort of one to two week report, I was not expecting him to come back and say he's done a full forensic investigation into Horizon. That wasn't what I was expecting back. Um, can we turn, please, to Mr. Ismay's oral evidence to the inquiry? Uh, it's INQ. Zero 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 sorry four zeros one zero six three. And could we turn please to page 26.
And if we could focus on the top two, that, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, line 16 of page 101, um, Mr. Ismay has asked the question, what were the terms of reference for, writing of the, for the writing of the report? He refers to not being given written terms. And at page 25, he says, Dave, I think, was relatively new to post office. Uh, sorry, line 25. Dave, I think, was relatively new to post office. I think he was only managing director for about a year. I think he came from somewhere in Royal Mail, and he went back to somewhere in Royal Mail. In the period that he was there, I think that, given the comments that he was hearing allegations, this was a question to me to say, well, you know, what's the counter-argument to this? Was that what you asked him to do, to provide you with a counter-argument to allegations? No, no, I stand by what I said. Can we go back, please, to POL 2017098? So we at the bottom was the email from shareholder executive that I um, took you to earlier. The top email is from Tracy Aberstein. Is that was your personal assistant? That's correct, yes. And you see at the top, it says, from Tracy Aberstein on behalf of David Wise Smith, uh, where on the from line beneath Mike Granville. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And is this a, how would this email have come about? Would it have been dictated? Uh, I would have thought so. I can't, I can't recall exactly, but I would have thought so. So the response is, um, Mike Gran sorry, the, the uh, email says, Mike Granville will liaise with you both to prepare a brief for Oliver to give the reassurance required. Is that not what Rod Ismay is saying, that he was asked to provide a brief or a report uh, that set out grounds for reassurance in the Horizon IT system? I don't think those are the words that he used. Um, we, we may be splitting hairs here. As, as I said, um, the genesis of the report was a combination of what is here and what was in the Channel 4 email that we've gone through earlier. And I was asking for, essentially, a summary position on, on our thoughts around those areas, um, which we could then use to respond back to Oliver, for sure, but that wasn't the only purpose of the report. Could we please go to POL 20106867, sorry, 20106867. And could we start, please? I think it's page five. Uh, you could just go down slightly, please. It might be the next page. I do apologise. No, my my error. Page three. I'm terribly sorry. Go down, please. You remember this email from Andy Haywood, which we looked at at the, the yes. start of your evidence? Uh, so that's on the 26th of February 2010. And you remember it said, number three, conduct full investigations into integrity issues. Could we look at page nine of this document, please? Uh, and this is from Sue Lowther, 8th of March, so it follows that email, it's later in the chronology. It says, as was discussed on the conference call and taking into account Rob's comments to confirm that what we are looking at is a general due diligence exercise on the integrity of Horizon, 
to confirm our belief in the robustness of the system and thus rebut any challenges. This is, um, do you accept that this is effectively asking um, for a document or a, an investigation that would, rather than investigate integrity issues, uh, would look to uh, confirm the belief and provide assurance for um, post office's position in the robustness of the system? Yeah, as, I mean, as I said before, I, I wasn't here when this came, but on the face of what I see here, yes. And do you think that's consistent with what Rod Ismay says he was asked to do? Um, it does look like it, yes. That can come down, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I, I'm struggling a bit with parts of this evidence, so c can I just recap a moment? Could we go back, please, to um, Mr Ismay's statement and the paragraphs you took, Mr. Smith, to paragraphs 39 and 41 on page 10 and 11. Yes, of course. It's WITN 04630100. Thank you. Uh, and it's page 10. Yeah. It's paragraph 39, is it not? So, yes, pa uh, pa paragraph 39, sir, page 10. Yeah. I know, sorry, that we're on the wrong witness statement. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. It's, it may, I may have given the wrong reference, sorry. The, the reference is 04630100. Page 10, please. Yeah. So in paragraph 39, Mr. Um, <clears throat> Smith, you see that um, it contains the sentence essentially in, in the middle of the paragraph. It was a summary of the existing conclusions, not an, a fresh investigation. Yeah? Yes, I see that. And then if we go to 41. It ends, there was no ready document available which pulled together reasons for assurance. Um, and my note, and this is what I want to check with you, is that you essentially agreed with Mr. Ismay's descriptions of what the report was to be as set out in paragraph 39 and 41. Sir, so, yes, that's correct. Fine. Then can we please look at your witness statement and this is pay, sorry, let me get the... Uh, it's WITN 04460100. Yeah. And I want you to go, please, to page 30, uh, paragraph 87. And then over the page to page 31. And reading that paragraph, as I will now, I have read Rod Ismay's statement dated the 13th of January and note that he says that he was asked to summarize existing conclusions. And then you say this, this is simply not my recollection and I do not believe that this is inferred by the email correspondence and then I interpose which we've looked at. Yeah. Uh, which is it, Mr. Smith? Well, what I mean by that is that the questions that I laid out for him, or for Sue, Mike, and, and Mike, which was the Channel 4 questions, I didn't think that they had been visited and written down and laid out anywhere previously. And so that's why I mean that it wasn't just 
pulling together what we'd already done. I was asking for the specific answers to these questions. Well, I, I and, found... I, and, I, and, and so that's all. I, I, we may be, you know, semantics of words here, but my view of what happened was here's a set of questions and here's also what we are getting from uh, Shecks. I would like you to report back to me, uh, talking to all of the relevant people in the business, to give me a, a summarized position of the answers to those questions. I, what I yeah. didn't say was, uh, go and do a fresh investigation, go and do a detailed investigation, or anything at all as to how he should carry out that investigation. I didn't give him that instruction. But what I draw from that, and this is what I want to be sure that I'm entitled to draw from that, that you did intend that he should um, effectively draw together conclusions which had already been arrived at. It was not an exercise in testing those conclusions. That is correct. It was not. I did not intend us to go and do a, a full forensic investigation, for example. So it, it, it's, if you like, um, so that I'm absolutely clear about this, there were a number of um, reasons already held uh, in senior levels of the post office as to why Horizon was robust. And what you were asking him to do, in effect, was to reduce those into writing in one document so that everybody knew what they were? Largely, yes. Yes. Right. OK, I've got it now. Thank you. So we mentioned a short break before lunch. Yeah. Uh, I think that's probably a good time to take that. All right. Uh, let's have a, well, a few minutes at least. Yes.
Sir, can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please, could we turn to uh, your witness statement, page 30, paragraph 86? Are you talking here about after receiving the Ismay report? You say, at the time, I do not think that we thought that there was any merit in commissioning a further report by an IT expert or a forensic accountant or similar to test the reliability of Horizon as the report was clear-cut in its position. There was nothing in it which suggested we should investigate Fujitsu or Horizon further. Um, that can come down. Uh, who was we when you say that? I, I'm talking here about a combination of the post office senior management team. Um, so this would have been Paula and would have been... Uh, Is it Paula Venels? Paula Venels, Mike Young, Mike Moores. It would have also been a set of conversations with the Royal Mail group, so certainly the chair and chief exec, and I, I would expect would have had a conversation about it. Um, uh, so there are a set of conversations rather than a set piece meeting to, to draw a conclusion. Well, your, your evidence earlier was that you, you hadn't asked Rod Ismay to do a forensic investigation into the Horizon yes. IT system. Um, and well, we've beat your evidence, but the, the evidence you just gave, this wasn't going to be a report that did a deep dive into whether or not Horizon was reliable. Yeah. So how on earth could you take comfort from that report that a further investigation um, by an IT expert or forensic accountant wasn't required? Well, at the time, the fundamental piece was that we believed that the system was tamper-proof. Um, so the Fujitsu position uh, that was laid out was quite clear. We um, had not seen in any of the sort of case, recent cases, um, any issues that would suggest a problem and, and in fact a few weeks later as we now know wrongly but at the time we saw the Seaman Mystery case as a, as a test of the Horizon system and it, it had come through that um, and so those were, the, those were the fundamental reasons Could we bring up the Ismay report please um, the reference is POL Sorry, it's P O L zero zero one zero seven one two nine. Apologies if I said the wrong reference. And if you could go to page ten, please. Four C. It says independent review and audit angles. Post Office Limited has actively considered the merits of an independent review. Um, this has been purely from the perspective that we believe in Horizon, but that a review could help give others the same confidence we have. And then the penultimate paragraph says, it is also important to be crystal clear about any review if one were commissioned. Any investigation would need to be disclosed in court, although we would be doing the review to comfort others. Any perception that Paul doubts its own systems would mean that all criminal prosecutions would have to be stayed. 
it would also beg a question for the Court of Appeal over past prosecutions and imprisonment. Was this the reason why you chose not to do no. an independent review? No, it wasn't. Why do you say that? Because I've given you the reasons why. Um, the fundamentals where we believe that the system was sound, that it couldn't be tampered with, um, and that that was tested a few weeks later in the Misery case as, as the latest example of uh, a series of those uh, tests of the system. So that were, those were the reasons that, were, that we made. It wasn't this particular point. Did that, uh, the reason given there of um, the issue of disclosure, did that play any, have any effect in your mind on whether no. or not? No. Um, the document could come down, thank you. You say that uh, the Misery case was seen as a test case. What, um, if any, steps did you take to oversee the conduct of that case by Post Office Limited? Um, well, you, you may recall that the case started some time before I joined and was um, uh, well in hand before, before I joined the business. So my own conduct in the case was limited. Um, I was aware of it uh, through its sort of April to September time frame. The relative importance of it obviously became clearer to me, so I became a little closer to understanding what the case headlines were, um, but I didn't review the case in detail, um, didn't have any conduct over the case, and was really um, looking at it from the perspective of, I'm keen to see what the results are, rather than having any conduct of the case. Could we look at poll 20169170? And the email at the very bottom is sent from John L. Singh. Um, I don't need to read it out. It's an email that's been read out in the inquiry several times before. Um, and it, uh, it states what the um, result of the Misra trial was and that she'd been convicted. And your response is, uh, on the 21st of October 2010. Rod, brilliant news, well done. Please pass on my thanks to the team. Why was this brilliant news? This is, uh, well, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to place on record an apology to Suma Misra and family because of the way this has been perceived and portrayed subsequently. And looking at it through their eyes rather than through mine, you can see that it may have caused substantial um, upset and I really do apologize for that. At, at the time what I'm doing here is what I would do generally with lots of things in business. I'm saying to the team thank you for all your hard work. Um, it's terrific that you've got the result that you've got and I'm really happy that we've progressed. It's, it's nothing more or less than that and in the context of probably receiving two to three hundred emails a day which would have been typical of that time I would literally have gone, brilliant news, well done, thanks very much, send. And that would have been it. Um, in the benefit of hindsight and looking through the 2024 lens, not the 2010 lens, um, at best, from SEMA's perspective, you can see this is really poorly thought through. Um, and I do apologise again for that. You referred earlier to it being a test case and... and did you place any reliance in the fact that Miss Misery was uh, Miss Misery was convicted um, in how to deal with the question of whether there should be an independent review in future? I can't be sure, to be honest, because it's it's way back in the midst of time. I do know that from this point forwards, we didn't really think about um, whether we should have an inquiry again while I was the, at the post office. Um, and certainly if you look at board minutes from the month after and the month after that, which had been shared with me, we're not talking about Horizon at all. Um, so it must have played some part in the thinking, but I can't be sure what part. 
sir. I'm looking at the time, and we have to finish Mr. Smith's evidence this morning. There are one set of um, uh, questions from uh, core participants. Uh, I propose at this point not to ask any further questions and, and hand over to the core participants. All right, let me unmute myself. Yes, that, that's fine. Um, who, who's going to ask some questions? It's uh, Hodge Jones Allen team. Right. Thank you. Sir, I would invite you to give this witness the warning against self incrimination. Well, I think I'm entitled to be told in very brief terms without um, making your cross examination ineffective um, the basis for that. And I'm literally asking just for a few sentences, Ms. Page. We say that the Ismay report was a cover-up. Right, all right. Well, Mr. Smith, under our law, a witness at a public inquiry has the right to decline to answer a question put to him by counsel to the inquiry or by any other legal representative, or for that matter, uh, put to you by me. Uh, if there is a risk that to answer that question would incriminate the witness. Uh, the legal principle is known in shorthand form as the privilege against self-incrimination. It's been suggested to me that I should give you um, <clears throat> uh, a direction about that, and I think it probably is appropriate, given what Ms. Page has had to say. Um, it is for you to make clear to me, in respect of any question put to you, that it is your wish to rely upon the privilege against self-incrimination. If, therefore, Miss Page, or, for that matter, me, if I intervene, asks you any questions uh, <coughs> which you do not wish to answer on the ground that to answer such questions might incriminate you, you must tell me immediately after such question is put to you. At that point, I will consider your objection to answering the question and thereafter rule upon whether your objection should be upheld. Mr. Smith, are you um, assisted by a solicitor or barrister in the hearing room today? So, yes, I am. Right. So, if, if the point arises where you wish to take advice about a question, please alert me to that and then I will afford you the opportunity of taking advice, and then we'll go from there. So do you understand all that? Yes, so I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ms. Page. Thank you. Step, as the case may be. Thank you. So uh, you've heard what I've already said. I don't propose to go over the uh, Ismay report in any greater detail, but in short, the first question I ask is whether you deliberately had your team produce a report for you which would cover up the fact that you knew and everyone in your senior leadership team knew that Horizon's integrity was very much in doubt and that you wanted to cover that up. No, absolutely not. Well, then, if I may, I'm going to ask some questions about the Seema Misra trial in that case. This inquiry has seen a document which shows that not long before the trial, there was a meeting between Post Office and Fujitsu in which the receipts and payments mismatch bug was discussed. Have you seen any of the evidence or seen that document? I, you should I, have seen the document, at least. I have seen least. a document around a bugs and mismatch report, yes. And Gareth Jenkins, a witness at Seema Misra's trial, was in that meeting. Have you I, seen that? I, I believe you, I believe you. And various um, options for resolving that bug were discussed, one of which made it perfectly plain that Fujitsu had the power to remotely alter branch accounts. Uh, that was put forward as a way to resolve the consequences of the receipts and payments mismatch bug. Did you see that? Yes, I did see that. Now, your legal department, your criminal law team, knew about that on the Friday,
before Mrs. Misra's trial started on the Monday, because we have uh, evidence which shows that that document that you've read was emailed to them, and it was printed out by John L. Singh on the Friday before the Monday start. What sort of culture were you presiding over where a legal department receives evidence of a bug in a trial which was about Horizon and they do not disclose that bug? What sort of culture were you presiding over? Firstly, to say that um, the only reason that I know about the bug and mismatch report is because it was presented to me in the bundles that I've seen. Um, so at the time, I was unaware. It's also fair to say that it was not pulled out in the Ismay report um, as one of the Horizon um, bugs. The others were listed, but it was not. So I was not aware of it. And I did not know until you have just told me uh, that Mr. Jarnell had the information that you have laid out at the time that he had it. Uh, in terms of the culture of the organisation, uh, I'm shocked and frankly appalled if that is in fact the sequence of events. Um, and I didn't know about it. Well, one of the points that was made in the Ismay report was that there were no back doors into Horizon accounts. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Did you know about the fact that your staff, a little bit after the report was finished, sent emails to one another, including to Rod Ismay, in which they said that they knew about the back doors they knew about the back doors because of that meeting about the receipts and payments mismatch bug. Did you know that? No, I didn't know any of this. Nevertheless, during the trial, as we've seen, uh, because of your response to the famous bandwagon email, you were keeping an eye on that trial, weren't you? Only in overview terms. I didn't know anything about the detail of the case. Well. Uh, let's bring it up again. It won't take long. This is the last um, thing we need to look at. Uh, poll 0016-9170. So... If we just look at that uh, second paragraph from Rod Ismay, Dave and the ET, that's the executive team, isn't it? Yes. Have been aware of the significance of these challenges. <coughs> that meant challenges to Horizon, didn't it? Uh, I think so, yes. And have been supportive of the excellent work going on in so many teams to justify the confidence that we have in Horizon and in our supporting processes. So this trial was being used, wasn't it? It was being used not as a criminal trial to determine whether somebody was guilty or not guilty of a crime, but it was being used to justify the confidence that you had in Horizon. No, that's not the case. It was, a, it was being carried out through the normal course of events. Why then did Mr Ismay, the man that you say was in high regard across the business and you therefore chose him to write your report, why was he saying that the excellent work in that trial was to justify the confidence that we poll have in Horizon? I don't know. You'd have to ask him. I don't know why he chose those words. In the aftermath of the Ismay report, this trial of Seema Misra was being actively used by post office as part of your campaign to claim that Horizon was robust, wasn't it? I don't believe so, no. You were deliberately closing your eyes 
to problems with the integrity of Horizon data, weren't you? No. And you were encouraging your staff to pursue a trial as another method of shoring up a problem system which you knew had serious question marks over it. Absolutely not. As I said to you before, the, the Suma Misra case started long before I joined the business. And, and you were watching it closely, weren't you? We were watching it, yes. And you were encouraging your staff to pursue that trial as a test of Horizon? Not to pursue it as a test of Horizon, no, to pursue it if it was appropriate to do so, like all other cases. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Ms. Page. And that's it, is it, Mr. Stevens? Uh, yes, sir, that is it. Right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smith, for uh, making a witness statement and for answering all the questions put to you. I'm grateful to you. Thank you, sir. Right. We'll adjourn until... Uh, if we start, give ourselves a full hour, five past two, we should get through the afternoon, Mr. Stevens, yeah? Yes, thank you, sir. Fine. That's what we'll do.